to visit the wonderful world of the great outdoors with the Southern Sportsman, Frank White. Brought to you in part by House Autry, proven cornmeal and flour products. Happy Jack dog care products. Ask for Happy Jack, your dog would. Long haul jeans, manufactured by John Bill Incorporated. The Southern Sportsman Game and Seafood Restaurant, the best food from field and ocean. And by American Choice Firearms Insurance, by Markell Service Incorporated. Today we will fish a breakwater for speckled trout, visit a famous oyster festival, and cook herb-baked trout in the kitchen. You can use uh, any good white meat fish for this particular recipe, snapper, uh, if you have it, or flounder, or in fresh water, rockfish, largemouth bass, smallmouth bass, really doesn't matter. I'm using speckled trout today because we're going speckled trout fishing on the show uh, in just a little while. Now, the first thing I did, I've got a couple of big fillets here, roughly a pound uh, of fish, and I marinated it uh, for a couple of hours in milk. Milk is one of the best marinades uh, that you can get. Uh, I always marinate my shark meat uh, overnight in milk before I cook it the next day. It's uh, the number one marinade that I would recommend for a gamey kind of bird, uh, like for instance a marsh hen or a woodcock, something of that sort. Uh, and it's also good to marinate uh, the fish. It's uh, very mild, of course, sweet milk. It does not impart any uh, special harsh flavor or anything like that. But any other flavor that might be in there uh, that's gamey or otherwise undesirable, milk as a rule will take it out. Now what I need to do is uh, after they've been in there, and uh, of course I went ahead and did that, did the marinating because you don't want to sit here two hours and uh, watch fish marinate in milk. That's sort of like watching grass grow or something like that. It's really quite boring. So I went ahead and did it, and it's just plain sweet milk. And now what I'm going to do is uh, blot them dry, <coughs> dry them off, like this. Now these are skin fillets. These are trout fillets, speckled trout fillets, but they have been skinned, as you'll see here. Uh, just uh, when they were filleted, they were filleted off the skin rather than scaling them. Now I've got a greased bacon dish over here, lightly greased to keep the fish from sticking when it goes in the oven, which incidentally is uh, set on 550 degrees. So I put the fish in here like this. And like all of my television recipes, I've only got a few minutes to do them, and so they're just nice and simple and easy. But this one is quite good, and I think you can imagine as you see what I'm doing. Uh, I'm salting and peppering here right now. But it's just a nice, simple, easy little recipe to whip up real fast. Uh, now the recipe calls for a tablespoon of lemon juice, and I'm just going to squeeze this little fresh lemon half over it until I got about a tablespoon there in my estimation. Uh, this is one of my sort of course measures here. And uh, you see that where it says basil or thyme? It could also say if we didn't put up there or tarragon or marjoram. Just take the herb uh, or the herb if you prefer. I call him herb. But uh, take the herb of your choice and sprinkle just a little of that on. And this happens to be thyme, but it can be tarragon, rosemary, uh, doesn't really matter just uh, some herb of your choice, and that's why we call it herb-baked speckled trout. Uh, or, in the case of rockfish, herb-baked rockfish. Okay. Now, at this point, I've got a medium, thinly sliced onion, and I put the onion slices on top of the fish, like this. And I have a can of chicken broth, just off your grocery shelf at home, and just kind of pour it around the edge in there. Let it go around the sides until the fish is uh, almost covered, like that. Now the recipe also calls for seasoned breadcrumbs. I sprinkle them on top of all that. and a quarter of a cup of butter, which is a half a stick. And we just put little pats of butter all around on the fish. And I repeat, the oven is set on 550 degrees. Now that's quite hot as you can, 
can imagine, 550 degrees. So we're only going to cook this about 12 minutes. We're going to cook it just until the onion rings, or the onion slices are nice and uh, tender, just beginning to soften. And that's all we'll need to do. Uh, it always takes a little time to get the butter on here. I'm not stalling. I'm just uh, trying to talk, keep you entertained while I'm putting on the butter. But we need lots of butter on this, on the top. And I'm trying to get it all in there. Okay, for this much fish, that's about, that's not quite a half a stick, but that's almost half a stick. So it goes into the 550 degree oven. And I'll try to remember to get back to it uh, in about 12 minutes, somewhere there about, somewhere about the second break in the show. Uh, and if not, uh, I've asked the floor crew if the studio catches on fire uh, to let me know, and I'll just get up and leave uh, during the middle of the show. So uh, in the meantime, while that's cooking, and I'm getting over into the living room to talk to you about a trip I'm going to take your speckled trout fishing, please pay attention to these very important messages. You can't be newlyweds forever. Oh. Michael and I promised each other the honeymoon would never end. Gloria, oh, it's gotta end. Otherwise, you'd never get your housework done. <laughs> See how Roy Lamont knows everything? Yeah. I'm proud of you, dummy. Hey, listen, uh, how, how much they charge for getting someone a date? Two, three dollars? No, I think it's more like 15 or 20. 20 bucks? See, look, Elroy, for 20 bucks, I put on a formal gown and a tiara, and you can take me to the party and bring me back home, and I'll smack your face and try to get fresh. <laughs> You insist I go. Okay, Buster, out with it. Out with what? Why aren't you mad about me going to California? You want me to be mad? If you loved me, you'd be mad. Okay, I'm mad. You are not mad. Yes, I am mad. No, you're not. I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm mad. Speckled trout is uh, quite often referred to as the weak fish, and particularly up north you will hear it referred to, but quite often in books you'll see where they have a reference to it, uh, is the weak fish. Not because it's weak by any means, it's quite uh, game as a fish, but because it has weak parts around the mouth. And quite often if you hook one and the hook gets into that paper-thin edge or that, that compartment around the mouth, it'll wear a big hole. And if you don't keep a good solid pressure, if you give him a chance to shake his head a little bit or to come out of the water, and shake his head, quite often they'll throw the hook because they'll wear a big hole out of it. That's why they're called a weak fish. There are two of them. There's the gray trout or the summer trout, which is the first cousin to the speckled trout or the winter trout. The winter trout is my favorite. Now you always find the winter trout somewhere near close to shore. Quite often you find them back in the creeks and in the marshes, but even when they go out into the ocean in the winter time, they'll hang around close to the beach. And really what they're doing when they're migrating out like that in the fall uh, as we're going to take you today fishing for them during the fall, as they migrate out of the creeks and the marshes and go out into the ocean, uh, they're following the bait. One of the prime places that I know of in the country for the fish uh, to be in November, late November and in December, it depends on how mild the weather is, and as long as the water is anywhere near uh, that it will support bait, you will find trout uh, under the bait. 
And one of the most popular places that I know of is the jetty at Cape Lookout down in North Carolina. Now, that jetty's been there for many, many, many years. Uh, it, it was put in there a long time ago to build a harbor out at Cape Lookout, and that was abandoned, but uh, the jetty is still there. And when the fish come out of all of those sounds in North Carolina, come through that narrow inlet there at Barton's Inlet at uh, Cape Lookout and go through the bight and out into the ocean, uh, as that bait goes past the jetty, it provides cover for these trout. That's where we're going to take you right now. I'm going with a biologist friend of mine who incidentally has filled me in on all this information. This is Jim Brown. He lives at Moorhead City. He's a biologist and he's in charge of the Saltwater Recreational Fisheries Division uh, of the Marine Resources Department down there in North Carolina. He specializes in recreational type of fishing. We left uh, the harbor there in Moorhead City went out through Beaufort Inlet and across the ocean directly over it's nine miles from the mouth of the inlet over to Cape Lookout where this jetty is. Now we got there real early in the morning. Uh, it, the fish don't always bite early in the morning and they didn't bite particularly in, uh, early but you see the rock sticking up there. We got over there while the tide was still coming in it was high tide about 10 o'clock that morning. Well, we got there about 7, shortly after sunrise, maybe 7.15 or something like that. Uh, we're fishing today with Gail Hill and Ed Jones. They're from Durham, North Carolina, and are friends of Jim's. And when we got there early, what was biting was false albacore. Uh, it, it's a member of the tuna family. Not a desirable eating fish, I think, but one of the sportiest fighting fish and there were just a jillion birds around. The water was full of bait, and the fish were feeding under them, or else the fish were feeding, and they were driving bait to the top, and the birds were getting over them. That's the way it works out. But this is a super, super fighting fish, and uh, these guys catch them, and, and they make strip baits out of them. Now, I'm heard, I've heard that they are adequate to eat, that they are edible. You can make a uh, salad out of them, sort of like a tuna salad, except a false albacore salad. <coughs> Jim fought this one down. Uh, this one is go, I would guess, we didn't weigh him, but I would guess he's about six or seven pounds, maybe eight. I don't know. They're shaped very much like a football, a member of the tuna family, and very hard fighting fish. And they just kill themselves. When you catch one, he will fight until he's dead. This fish is practically stiff. I mean, he's not going anywhere. If you put him back in the water, I doubt really if he would recover. But see how fat and streamlined uh, he is there? He's built sort of like a nuclear submarine or something like that. Well, they were around us, and in fact, we couldn't get to the trout because uh, of the albacore. Now, I'm just watching my line disappear here. I had a, a ultralight spinning outfit that had about 200 yards of six pound test line on it. And he just took every bit of it, but I turned him. Uh, I didn't have him on for a minute like it's going to appear here. I had him on for about 30 minutes, and I just kept fighting him and kept fighting him. The main thing is he had a lure on that six-pound line that I wanted to get back. It was one of my favorite bucktails, and I didn't have many of them. In fact, I only had two on this trip, and I lost them both uh, to these albacore. But I was fishing for trout with this ultralight rig, and this albacore picked that bucktail up off the bottom and just went out of sight practically. And I played him perfectly until I got him right at the boat and I didn't loosen my drag up enough. I loosened it up and he made one lunge right at the boat and got off there. That was him that you saw roll up. But he made just one spurt away and got away. Well, Gail had hers uh, on about 12 pound line or maybe 14. And so she played it on down. And you can see there, he's just fighting to the absolute last gasp. But they're very dark meat fish, very bloody fish. Now I'm told if you cut their throat immediately when you bring them on board and you want to hang them overboard to do that so they bleed in the ocean because they are quite, quite bloody fish. But I'm told if you just cut his throat right now and bleed him, uh, that he is edible. Barely edible, but edible. But I've never tried one, so I can't testify that one way or the other. Well, as I say, we got there a little early that morning, and trout is what we were after on this jetty, or breakwater at Cape Lookout, and the crowd began to gather. It's about high tide now, and most of the rocks are under the water, but this is a dangerous place if you don't know where this jetty is. Quite often, some guy that doesn't know where he's going, the first time he's ever been there, will come blasting through here in an outboard wide open, 
and he'll run across that jetty and goodbye outboard motor. Uh, and, and inboard motor too, for that matter. Prop, rudder, everything. Uh, so if you go out there at Cape Lookout and you see these boats lined up out there, don't go blasting right through the middle of them because you're liable to find out that you run into a rock quarry and that the bottom of your boat has departed. As the tide started to go out, the bait started to concentrate around the jetty. And that's when we started picking up the speckled trout, which is what we were after. It's one of Jim's favorite fish. I guess it's my favorite saltwater fish. Uh, <clears throat> my favorite all-time saltwater sport fishing is fly fishing for dolphins, but I only get to do that about once every three years because that's a very specialized sport. It's not fair to go out there with five or six people and ask everybody to stand around with their arms folded while you fight a, a, a dolphin on a fly rod for an hour and a half or two hours. So I don't get to do that very often. But speckled trout is my favorite fish uh, and especially for inshore fishing. And in the fall of the year, now this is after Thanksgiving. It's the last weekend in November. In fact, it was, uh, it was the Monday following. It wasn't a weekend day, but it was the Monday after Thanksgiving. And Gail's got a nice little one on here. A good eating fish. I prefer it over the gray trout, its first cousin. Uh, the gray trout is a little softer, I think, a little mushier. This fish is much firmer and fights better and not often found in deep water. He's usually found in shallow water, either in the creeks, in the marshes, or along the beaches. I have caught them in the surf along the outer bank, and when you catch them on a slough like that, in the winter times, you'll catch one every calf standing there with a light tackle and throwing out a grub or a plug. Now what we're using is a grub, uh, the lime green one with the curly tail. Just, just a bright lime green colored grub on a jig head. And these guys right next to us, they must have caught about 55 or 60. I don't know how many they caught. And they were nice ones. They were catching some nice four and five and six pound trout but apparently they were in exactly the right spot. Their boat was backed up there to a hole, a deep place right near the jetty, and the fish were concentrating in there. They were moving all up and down the jetty, and everybody was catching some fish. But some guys that were in the choice spots along the jetty were catching more fish than others, and uh, uh, that jetty is quite popular. I have caught them there as late as December the 20th, and uh, they may hang around even later than that, but it depends on what kind of weather we have leading up to that. But sometime around the end of November uh, and then going on into uh, uh, December, you will catch the big speckled trout along the jetty at Cape Lookout. I'll be back here in a minute. There's a very well-known, uh, becoming quite famous oyster festival that's put on every year down in North Carolina. It's been put on for about the past 10 years now, and it keeps uh, gaining in popularity. And we're going to take you uh, uh, on a trip down there to eat a few oysters in just a minute after these very important messages. I realize a lot of you folks out there can't buy these fine House Autry Mills products because you've told me so. Your grocer just doesn't stock them. We're sure your store manager wants to serve your needs, so copy this address and give it to him. Tell him you want to buy these House Autry products. Some things like House Autry are worth asking for. House Autry Mills will be happy to serve you and your grocer with the finest products at a fair price. House Autry Mills products, worth asking for. American Choice Firearms Insurance by Markel Service Incorporated can protect your valuable firearms collection for as little as $20 a year. As an example, your homeowner's insurance probably covers only $250 to $500, and that'll hardly buy you one decent shotgun, much less replace your entire collection and accessories. Call toll-free 1-800-446-6678 or in Virginia 1-800-552-6515 for information on protecting your valuable collection. No salesman will call you. These important numbers will appear again at the end of the program. One of our most popular dishes at the Southern Sportsman is the sweet and sour duck, a special recipe. The same goes for our frog legs. We cook them different. And Frank's fried shrimp, marinated in cognac, fried in a beer batter, served with a special sauce, Wow, you could say that about all 25 of our recipes on the Southern Sportsman menu. 
our most frequent complaint is that we don't charge enough. Well, we put out the best game in seafood we can at the Southern Sportsman at a fair profit. If you don't think you've paid enough, fine. Give the rest to your favorite charity with our compliments. Sneaky Snake, the live-action salt flavor worm, is the hottest bass-busting lure on the market. The folks at Seeker Lure make you this fantastic yet acquainted offer. We'll send you an assortment of 60 Sneaky Snakes and 140 tournament-tested worms and 100 Red Hot Crappy Jigs and 40 Frog Traders and 20 of the newest in lures, The Shining Shad, for the unbelievable low price of $23.95. That's a $60 value for $23.95. Call toll-free or send your check or money order to Sneaky Snake, Post Office Box 710, Mountain Home, North Carolina, 28758. Uh, I want to hasten to point out here that uh, false albacore, generally you catch those things further offshore, but in the fall they come in to meet the bait there and you find them out there, but always near reasonably deep water. But uh, you troll for them and you catch them 8, 10, 12 miles offshore, sometimes 40, 50 miles offshore. Uh, but they are distinguished from the Pacific alba albacore, which uh, you find out on the west coast, only in the Pacific Ocean, and that albacore is quite good to eat. They both belong to the tuna family, but the false albacore is one of the darker meat, red meat ones, and is not as good to eat uh, as its famous uh, Pacific cousin. Uh, one of my favorite things that I like to do in the fall is go around to some of these festivals where you get a chance to eat a lot. Eating is one of my favorite hobbies. Uh, in Virginia, uh, there's the very well-known Urbana Oyster Festival that they have early ever no every November. And somewhere along uh, the middle or the latter part of October, or along in there, early November, they have started having a quite well-known uh, oyster festival and fish fry and chicken fry and barbecue and everything else at a little community called Mill Creek down in North Carolina. Now, Mill Creek is just north of the town of Newport, not too far from Moorhead City. For those of you that go up and down that part of the world, it's between Cherry Point and Havelock and Moorhead City and a little north of the main highway there. Mill Creek has uh, its own uh, fire department, its volunteer fire department and rescue squad. And they do this every year to raise money for it. A friend of mine, Nick Culpepper down there, that you saw if you watched a few weeks ago, we went fishing down there in his front yard. But Nick is always very prominent in putting this thing on. And I thought I'd take you today and show you uh, this little festival that they have down there every year. 10 or 12 or 15,000 people show up at this thing. And it's generally held somewhere around the, the firehouse there. Uh, I think we got a piece of film here somewhere, don't we? Uh, yeah, here we go. And uh, the people line up there to buy tickets, depending on what uh, they want. Uh, you can get uh, plates of uh, barbecued chicken, barbecued uh, pork, all the fish you can eat for $3. You can keep going back and back. But the most famous thing is this year down there, now the price varies according to their scarcity and how hard they are to catch. But this year for $8, you could have all the oysters you could eat and they have a big steaming uh, kind of a place down there. Now this is the fish frying place, and uh, this is where you'll always find my buddy Nick Culpepper. Spots and croakers and things like that. The guys go out with nets and hook and line and everything else. The people that are involved in the rescue squad and the fire department down there, and they catch fish for a week in advance. That's the way the guys spend their time out there, which is not a bad way to perform your civic duty. Just go out every day and fish for a week so you have enough fish for these people. They had about 10,000 people show up, somewhere between 10 and 11,000. It's an all-day thing, and uh, they, they couldn't count them. There wasn't any way they could keep a count on them. But this thing went on all day, started in the morning, and just goes on until night. And this will give you some idea about how they turn out the oyster roasts. Uh, but they roast oysters on these big platforms here. There are two of them. And for $8, you go in an enclosure. You just pay $8, and they let you in a gate that's fenced in, and you can stay in there until somebody has to come and wheel you out in a wheelbarrow if you want to. You can eat all the oysters that you want to eat, and they will steam them for you. You can get them raw, too, if you'd rather have them that way, but you get them steamed. And uh, this is not a bad way to while away an autumn afternoon, if you want to know the truth. It's one of my favorite ways. But they put the oysters up there just in the pitchforks full and steam them on these big long grills and pass them on to the folk. Now this is held down there every year. 
And the word gets out when they're having it. That gentleman there is enjoying himself. Oh, this is the hush puppy making machine. You just crank it and it just turns out hush puppies by the tons. Oh, they have music, they have bands come in and play. And if you don't care for the barbecue or the fish fry, uh, you can always get a hot dog for 60 cents down there. Uh, but that's put on by some friends of mine down at Mill Creek, and it's put on for the benefit of uh, the rescue squad down there at Mill Creek and also the volunteer fire department. Uh, it's a good cause, and you can go down there and have a good time. And uh, next year, you might want to keep your eye out and your, and your ear open for hearing uh, when that stuff is coming up. I'll be back here in a minute with a final word after this. <laughs>